insights for 2024 and beyond with Brett Kerhofer, market strategy lead from Hireology and Mission Care Collective CEO, Brandy Kritika. Brett, you may begin. All right. Thank you, Diana. Thanks for having us here. Uh, just a quick intro about myself. My name is Brett Kerhofer, uh, healthcare strategy lead here at Hireology. Been with the business now uh, a little over seven years, um, and I've had the pleasure of spending those seven years uh, almost exclusively focusing on and working with customers in the post-acute care space, uh, helping them build their best team. So excited to be here with Brandy. Uh, I'll kick it over to her to intro herself. Thanks, Brett. Hi, everyone. Brandy Kurtaika, CEO of Mission Care Collective. Uh, I live and breathe the direct care workforce for um, the past 10 years. So we have the privilege of uh, connecting millions of people to work and kind of seeing from a front lines perspective what's working, what's not working, and happy to be here today to, to share that insight. Back to you, Brett. All right, let's go ahead and uh, kick off today's webinar, sort of setting the stage and talking a little bit about the state of the market. Uh, I know that Brandy and the Mission Care team have put together some great content here, so I'll, uh, we'll start here and then we'll get into the next couple of slides talking about that state of the current job market. Thanks, Brett. So I only have a couple slides today, and I am here to bring the human side of recruitment. So data is powerful, but it's even more powerful when it's married with an understanding of the people behind the data. And so for those that, that might not know us at Mission Care Collective, we help companies recruit and retain millions of healthcare workers each year. And as part of our work, we're actively talking to our caregiver community to better understand what they're thinking, what's important, what's not important, why they stay, why they go. And, and not only so we can use this data to, to help find more caregivers nationally to stick around, but for the industry and for people like you to help keep a pulse on the market. So in a second here, Brett's going to share a clip with you from a really meaningful project that's near and dear to my heart. It's it's from the One Voice Many Stories project. And this was a, a partnership and a collaboration with the National Association for Home Care and Hospice. And we sat down with home care workers, I personally did across the nation, to hear their stories, like raw, live, candid, on camera asking them all the hard questions to better understand what makes these um, individuals tick. And this video in particular, it's part of a, um, a broader series, if you will. But for the focus of today's session on talent acquisition, I want to specifically share one clip when we sat down and we talked to direct care workers. Again, these are primarily home care workers, some with a lot of experience, some with a little of experience on why they ultimately choose a company. So yes, money's important. Yes, wages are important, but it really kind of goes deeper into their soul in terms of why they, they join a company. So uh, Brett, if you can go ahead and kick us off with this video, check this out. All right, thank you. I definitely love the company getting together, knowing who is the CEO, love the history, because I read and research, you know, um, the value system. I was impressed when certain companies that I went for, they all, what they had in common, they started from family. There was someone that basically, you know, had that idea. They were all family and this and another. And, you know, something gels with me. I want to work for companies that value their workers. I want to work with companies that the person that's interviewing me or that's welcoming me to their company, that they don't look at me just as a CNA. Like some companies only look at, oh, you're just a CNA. No, I'm not just a CNA because without me being a CNA, it would be no nurses. We all work together. It just goes back to that level, level one, level two. You know, we have to climb that. I apply to jobs that have, number one, of course, um, the money, if they have benefits, um, if there's room for me to grow and become more than just a CNA, like some uh, CNA jobs, they have like where you can become a, um, a staffing person or um, um, a medical assistant, whatever it is where I can grow. 
that's what's going to make me go for that company right there. I look for a company that is that has high standards for or higher standards for for caregiving for the caregivers, right? Such as benefits, such as different incentives, you know, different uh, recognition, like you know, maybe Christmas parties or even acknowledgement of a birthday or something like that. And uh, agencies that that um, you know have good standards, you know, for their clients as well. Yeah, and provide good um, home care, you know, services to clients. I want to work someplace where a peer recommended and they know the background, they know my personality, they know what would fit me. So I would go based on a referral as well as I would research the company and see what their values and their mission involves. And I, um, like you say, it's several. I have worked for two or three at one time because certain ones will only give you four hours a day. Certain ones will give you nine. When I'm looking for a company to join, I look for communication, team aspect, and something that actually fit my availability, you know, upon my disability as well. So I do have a disability. When I apply to my job is um, that they have a vision. The vision is same thing to, to care for the people and work as a team. And that we communicate that there is good communication that I can call them and say, you know, this is happening. What should I do? Or the patient has changed and that we um, have you good communication. The sign-on bonuses are important to me because um, they make you want to work. They make you feel like, you know, you have something, you have an incentive to look forward to. Like, it's like, okay, if I do this and do that, then I'm a, I'll am get this bonus. Like, and it makes you feel appreciative. It makes you feel like, you know, when, they, when any job have any kind of bonus, whether it's a sign-on or they have like different incentives, gift cards, stuff like that, they get you in. It's like, it make you feel appreciated. I only work for companies that I look into their background, their history. I look at their turnover for employees. I go and not only let them interview me, but I interview them as well, because there's certain points that they have to meet for me in order for me to feel good, because we are a representation of whoever we work for. That one person reflects on everyone sometimes, and you only get a first impression once. So I want to make sure that for me personally, when I'm seeking out different companies to work for, that I know everything about them that I can know on my end without them telling me. And then when I go in, I want to have that good welcoming feeling, like I matter for them. You know, just a, a couple of things to take from this video is you think about growing your workforce in 2024. Keep in mind that um, from a direct care workforce perspective, like caregivers want to know they matter. They want to know they're not a number. They want to know they're part of something. Yes, they need the money and the wages and the benefits, but they stay and they're attracted to mission and purpose and communication and if you put this insight at the heart of recruitment, it does more than drive applicants. It drives people that ultimately um, stick around and deliver more care. So with that, I will pass it back to you, Brett. Great. Thank you, Brandy. That's a, a fantastic video and, and really hits home on a lot of the uh, topics that we're about to cover today. So I um, definitely love for, the... Let's, thanks for go ahead and doing that. Let's uh, let's jump forward now um, and let's go ahead and dig into the industry outlook. So um, commenting on the sort of state of the uh, job market today, it might feel as though that there are two conflicting job markets. Um, on one hand, you have the, the tech space, let's call it. You, know, you might see in the news layoffs from Facebook and Amazon, these big tech companies. Uh, many businesses in this sector are dealing with layoffs and hiring freezes due to the recession. Um, and they overhired in the pandemic. And this has left really the number of active job seekers in the sector outweighing the number of open jobs. But with other industries that employ hourly, uh, essentially workers, um, like the healthcare sector, they're facing a completely different reality. Facilities that offer long-term care, skilled nursing, uh, home care, home health, uh, most importantly, they struggle with retention more than any other type of employer. 
And given the continued shortage of active job seekers on the market today, most are unable to build a pipeline of talent strong enough to quickly fill these open roles. And so what's causing this churn? What's causing it? It's, it's really burnout. Okay. Burnout impacts healthcare workers more than it does any other industries, nurses, CNAs, caregivers, and other uh, type of roles. They serve long hours in person and on the front lines during the peak of the pandemic, which deeply impacted both their mental and physical health. And so now that the U.S. economy is back in full swing and hiring is booming, um, in other skilled sectors, uh, many of these people are choosing to pursue those sectors and, and go after low stress, more flexible work elsewhere. And so unfortunately for you, uh, this leads to an inability to care for patients and fill beds, which ultimately impacts the bottom line. To add further context uh, to the depth of this problem, I wanted to touch on some numbers. So according to a PwC audit, Nearly 80% of all healthcare executives see hiring as a top business risk. And to illustrate just how competitive the space is right now for top talent, healthcare is consistently one of the top industries in terms of new jobs added each year, according to the BLS. In October alone, healthcare led the way with 58,000 new jobs added. All of this is to say job seekers in the space today have plenty of options for work. Anyone on the market with the right skills for caregiving and CNA positions can find work quickly. So in order to capture your fair share, you need to find ways to add efficiencies in your hiring process and make offers faster than your competitors, which is exactly what we're here today to discuss further. So before we dive in, uh, dive in I want to uh, go through some details um, and, and touch on some of the common demographic characters of, uh, characteristics of caregivers, which play a key role in our best practices in uh, recruiting them. So demographically, caregivers are mostly female, and many of which have children at home, more likely to be low income, more likely to work multiple uh, hourly jobs. So what this tells us combined with the first stat about having children at home is that they're very busy and they're always on the go. Um, they're diverse. Uh, most uh, caregivers are uh, Black. And then you can see here what we also know about the job itself uh, it, is that it comes with health, health risks. So it's proven that direct care workers are more likely to suffer from anxiety and depression, right? They're exposed to daily illness, uh, suffering, even death in their day-to-day -day jobs. We know that they're more likely to experience high blood pressure and arthritis. The work itself is very stressful, right? It requires them to be on their feet, completing physical work for long hours on end. And just because um, of their interaction with people all day, they're more vulnerable to viruses and other diseases. Um, so it's, it's very important work, very stressful work. And what this tells us is that this group has unique needs for mental health, uh, support, PTO, and healthcare. So with an understanding of where we are in the job market today and what the typical caregiver demographics look like, let's dive into some home care talent acquisition strategies for 2024. We're breaking our 2024 advice down into three overarching themes. Number one, design roles that resonate with the premier caregiver candidates. Craft compelling job listings that set you apart from your peers. And number three, Optimize job distribution to ensure maximum visibility on the right platforms. So let's start with designing roles that resonate with premier caregiver candidates. Let me give you an analogy. Think about your jobs as products. Okay, so what do I mean by this? If you were building out a product or a service for sale, you need to create something that meets a need for customers whether that's cars, shoes, or clothing, uh, household appliances, any type of technology software, really anything manufactured for sale has to meet a need. Let's take your iPhone, for example, if you have one, um, or any smartphone. Today, the need is so much more than just calling, right? People want it to be user-friendly. They want it to have good camera. They want to have good storage and a long battery life. Phones today are built to meet a specific needs. So your jobs are no different. They need to meet a need. 
Your job isn't just about getting someone to work for you uh, in exchange for pay. Yes, of course, pay is one need, but there are so many others from work-life balance to health insurance to career fulfillment and growth and, and so much more beyond that. Remember, the employer and applicant roles are actually reversed in an applicant-driven economy. Applicants no longer need to convince you why you should hire them, but rather you need to convince top applicants why they should want to come work for you. You need to offer them a product that benefits them. So let's go ahead and dig in, into some of those components and really understand better what the caregivers want today. Each year at Hireology, we survey job seekers and workers in the healthcare space. And in our most recent survey, we asked what is most important to them when searching for a new job. While it should come as no surprise that the pay is the top answer, it's only the top answer for 30% of the applicants. That means that 70% uh, of, of people who filled out the survey, something else is on their top drivers for when looking for a job, right? Something else is more important for them. The next highest choices were flexibility, after that, career growth, and after that is fulfilling work. So we then asked a follow-up question, taking pay out of the equation. So take it out. It's all the same. If someone receives two offers, both of that similar pay range, they would be motivated to take the lower paying offer if they were offered added schedule flexibility, career growth opportunities, and good culture. All this is to say that when it comes to you designing your jobs as products, the need that your buyers or job seekers have is for flexibility, culture, and growth. So let's dive, uh, dive in into what you can offer and, and what people are telling us matters to them. Let's start off with this idea of flexibility. I know many employers see flexibility as remote work, which of course isn't possible for caregivers. So it's easy for you just to brush this off. But in reality, flexibility is so much more than remote work. People simply want to make work work for them. As part of a survey, we actually asked people to define flexibility. And here's some answers I think really get to what people are looking for today from their employers. So you can see the examples here on the screen. I'll call out you know, sort of two of them. The top right, a schedule that works with my needs as I'm a single mother with no family, that being said, I need to be available when my kids need me. If the school calls because my kid is sick, I have to leave work, pick up my child, and stay home with my sick child. And in the bottom left, you can see the ability to step out for an appointment or errand and get back to work as needed. Also, to have the ability to leave early or work late uh, when my schedule uh, you know, is needing that. So people aren't asking just to work from home. Uh, although many people do want that option, and it's something you should offer if you can, but it's more so that people want to be able to work around their lives, stop separating work and life, and be able to live more of a blended lifestyle where work and life coexist together. So when it comes down to it, people don't want work-life balance anymore. They don't want to have to separate themselves at work in their everyday lives. It's just life, right? With work blended into people's daily lives. And this is something that, you know, you can facilitate with flexibility. That's the most important thing that we know from, from uh, caregiver job applicants. Again, let's think back to the demographics of caregivers. They're working more than one job. They're parents. They're more prone to get sick. These are all things that you can accommodate by allowing someone flexibility in scheduling. Let them work from uh, hours that they want or that they choose, if you can do that. Let them have a say in their schedule. This is absolutely the type of benefit that's going to help you win over job seekers today and really should be table stakes when you're thinking about opening new positions. And when it comes to career growth in healthcare, it might be a little tougher to clearly define. Unlike in corporate settings, there isn't often a clear path that people can follow if they perform well in their current duties. Often, moving into hiring, uh, higher paying roles means gaining tenure or getting additional education and certifications. So what we've seen our customers do here is offer things like formal mentorship and job shadow programs, training and tuition reimbursement, regular coaching and one-on-ones. 
And then making a commitment to hire from within and promote from within. Culture uh, can oftentimes be tough to define in the healthcare sector too, but really it's it's based on the survey. What we know uh, is that it's important that it matters. Uh, so a few things here that we've seen our customers do. Number one, quality employee orientation that's engaging. So not just asking them to fill out paperwork on their first few days. Number two, fostering team building and bonding. So doing things like team outings, lunches, picnics, parties, celebrations, anything you can do there. Number three, spotlighting employee achievements. So employee of the month gets a bonus or maybe they get a gift card. Uh, number four, lead by example, right? Tenured veteran employees live and breathe your values. And that trickles down from the very top uh, all the way down to the frontline workers. And then finally, the hierology customers that we've seen really demonstrating a good culture always encourage feedback and honestly commit to acting upon it when they receive it. Okay, so now that we know how you define a job that resonates with caregivers and what they want, let's talk about how to craft compelling job listings that set you apart from your peers. Let's go back to the product analogy. Even if you have the best product in the world, people, uh, they're not going to know about it or buy it if you don't have good marketing. That's where job listings come into play. So what makes an effective job description? What, what is something that's enticing to job seekers? Essentially, every little detail matters. It needs to sell job seekers so they click and convert into actual applicants. Typically, what we recommend to our customers is to follow a structured formula with these. Don't start with responsibilities and duties. Rather, start with what makes your company unique, as well as a quick summary of the job for SEO purposes, and then dive right into the benefits or what's in it for the applicants. And of course, that's where you highlight everything we discussed above, flexibility, culture, benefits, career growth. Ask yourself, does your job description make you feel excited to work at this job and at this company? Use the job description to help uh, drive excitement and as a way to promote your employment branding across all SEO and job boards. Additional best practices when it comes to job descriptions include things like keeping your job title short and clear. It's important to avoid anything that comes across as too gimmicky, like in all, in all capital letters, flexible schedule or competitive salary on the job title itself. Because while this may seem like it could attract job seekers, it really comes across as sort of spammy and actually indeed tends to deprioritize these jobs in the organic results. Number two, catch the eye of top candidates with a catchy headline and a quick summary of your organization and the role. Sometimes all you have uh, is a few seconds to capture someone's attention, so you've got to make it count. Number three is in addition to the benefits you offer and explaining what's in it for the candidate, Include interesting tidbits that make your organization unique. Maybe you're family owned or you've won recent workplace awards. Let's highlight those because we know those matter. And number four is use bullet points and subheads to break up the text. Make it really easy to scan all the text with bullet points and headlines so people can jump into the sections they want to read most. So let's look at a quick example. Uh, you see on your screen here uh, that this one immediately leads with the why. They literally spell it out in a subheading that draws the eye. Compensation is highlighted right away. Something to note, many people don't even apply to jobs if they don't know what the comp is. So keep that in mind. And this also highlights why the work is so fulfilling and meaningful. And it addresses the flexibility need that most job seekers want today. All of this is also broken into different sections with bolded headers, uh, which makes it easy to scan and easy for job applicants to come in and understand what they're applying for. So on this same note here, I know that uh, Brandy has some feedback um, about the job postings today. So Brandy, I'll kick it over to you right now. Yeah, absolutely. So from a drug care workforce perspective, something to keep in mind Home care workers are not just looking for availability, they are looking for connectivity. So as you think about sitting down, whatever job post you're writing in the care space, here's my advice. Job postings with heart. Don't sound like a robot. 
be human. Uh, people genuinely in the space, they want to work for a company with a soul. They want to work for a company that has a story. Uh, one of our, our brands within Mission Care Collective is my CNA jobs. So we see thousands of jobs. We see jobs that get a lot of applicants. We see jobs that get uh, few applicants. Jobs that sound human and connect with, with a special, very, very unique population that can earn more money in almost any other profession, they get more volume. They, they get more applicants than jobs that just kind of sound um, robotic. Again, kind of going back to that video, think about who this workforce is. Like when you write a job post, think about actually the human that's reading it. So there's this huge disconnect in care. If you were to ask a direct care worker who my boss is, you want to know what they say? Scheduler, I'm connected to my patient. They're not really, really wedded to the, to the clients that they serve, or I'm sorry, the companies that they serve. So, you know, as you think about writing jobs, like that's my advice to you in terms of, you know, what we see um, working. Because at the end of the day, like you're not just trying to drive like, applicant volume, like jobs that connect also drive people that are more likely to be retained. You don't just want an applicant. You want an applicant that turns into an interview, that turns into a caregiver that, you know, shows up for onboarding, that turns into someone that's there after, after 90 days. That's kind of the, the holy grail. So as you, as you sit down, take kind of what, what, what Brett's saying here in terms of the, the function and, and key components to, um, to include but read it and say, okay, now that I know who these individuals are, does it connect? If it doesn't get to the soul, you're probably going to get passed by, if you will, in, in a click versus piquing someone's um, interest that's that's generally uh, interested. Man, that's that's really well said, Brandy. I like that. If it doesn't get to the soul, you can't stand out. Um, that, that's so important. And, and, and you know, culture what we know uh, from the previous slides is that that's of the most important things to, to job seekers. So um, that's awesome. All right. Uh, let's go ahead and pivot to the fact that we've talked about how to design a great product and you've marketed it the right way. Uh, let's go ahead and distribute it on the right channels now. And so again, let's go back to the definition of a product. Even if you have a great product and great ads, if no one sees it, um, you're not reaching the target audience on the right channels. Uh, it's all for waste. So um, you can see here uh, on, on, on this study here, all the channels that we've asked um, applicants to go ahead and tell us um, where they're looking for jobs, right? In our most recent applicant study, uh, we found that Indeed is actually by far the most common source with roughly 74% of caregiver job seekers using this channel at some point in their job search. The next top answers include Google search, LinkedIn, and employer branded websites. And then networking uh, or referrals came in at 30%. So taking a look at some Indeed best practices, since this is such a popular destination for job seekers, it's going to be competitive for you. And at Hireology, we work closely with Indeed, uh, our, integrate, our, our platform integrates directly, and we've uncovered some best practices to help customers stand out. And you can see these here on the screen. Um, so if you're posting to Indeed, keep these in mind as a way to stand out and make your job visible. Number one, job postings between 700 and 2,000 characters. And so that's right about 100 to 100, uh, 300 words. They get up to about 30% more applicants than other job postings. Number two, keep job titles to 35 characters or write about five words or less to optimize that mobile performance, right? People are looking uh, for jobs on their mobile phones all the time. We want to do everything we can to increase and optimize that mobile performance. Number three is indeed sponsored jobs are four and a half times more likely to result in a hire. Uh, better visibility means better uh, applicant flow and, and more likely to result in a hire. And then last, it's also important uh, when writing your job descriptions to avoid stock content that you've used and used and used over and over again. Uh, readers can tell it's not genuine. So things like inflated job descriptions that are trying to make day-to-day uh, -day work seem different than it really is. And, you know, maybe it's internal jargon that the average person doesn't know. All of this is going to turn away job seekers or lead to lower engagement on the front end. 
And then I wanted to make a quick note about referrals because uh, it's so, so important today. Uh, well, in the last question, only about 30% said that they've actively networked with friends and peers when looking for a job. Nearly 90% said that if someone they know and trust vouches for a company, they're more likely to apply to that job. So this speaks to the benefit of having a great rep uh, referral program internally that incentivizes your team to reach out to the networks rather than waiting on candidates to contact them via networking. So by and large, job seekers will apply to jobs if someone they know uh, encourages them to do so. But because they're not necessarily seeking these networking opportunities out themselves, it's important to put the onus on your existing team to reach out and start these conversations. And of course, that's where a great referral program comes into play. You should constantly be communicating your open roles to your current employees, make it really easy for them to submit referrals, even if it's by text message, and pay a reward bonus that's appropriate for the role that you're recruiting for. All right. Your own career sites uh, is also a great, important channel for driving applicants. We know, according to our survey, that right about 40% of all seeker, uh, job seekers visit an employer's website when deciding to apply. So what makes a good career site? You can see this example right here. A couple things to note. It shows how happy uh, employees are. Everybody's smiling. Uh, pictures on the front page here. Number two is that it explains what's in it for the job seeker. Just like with your job descriptions, always outline what you offer. Uh, competitive pay, flexibility, whatever sets you apart. And number three, show that you care about your employees. In this site, you'll see the headline, uh, quote, our commitment to the team. And then it goes in uh, to explain, you know, how they take care of their employees uh, as if their own residents in the facility. They provide things like growth and fulfillment to their employees and are committed to creating an environment that people are happy to work in. So talk about the commitment to the team. And then last, think of this as an extension of your own brand, right? Your website would make it clear as to why your organization provides great care to patients. So why wouldn't you do the exact same for your employees? More often than not, happy employees equals happy patients. And finally, while these are top sources we're seeing generally across the board when we survey customers and applicants, it's important to use data and analytics to understand what's working for you specifically. There are several metrics you can and should be tracking to better understand where you're getting the most bang for your buck, including applicants and candidates uh, per source. So understanding the sheer volume of applicants and candidates from each channel. Hires per channel, which is the number of applicants um, or number of hires per channel, right? Pay close attention to this because you might actually find that some sources tend to drive a ton of applicants, but very few hires. While the flip side of that is some channels might drive fewer applicants, but a lot of hires. The conversion rate is that much higher. Uh, this points to a quality issue. Then we can measure things like cost of each applicant and hire per source. What exactly is it costing you to get a hire from each source? Reducing your spend on sites that are bringing uh, the lower volume of hires and lower volume of quality applicants uh, at a higher cost can help you optimize your job board spend and drive ROI overall. Then you can see here things like fill rate, which of course is the rate at which you get your roles filled, and time to hire. So the overall average number of days it takes to move on uh, and take an applicant to a higher stage. Of course, candidate quality rate per source, so the percentage of applicants that become candidates. Again, this helps you drive ROI from a sourcing perspective. And then last uh, but not least is breakdown across teams and locations. So if you're managing multiple locations, uh, of course, you should be looking at this, uh, at this data from one location rather than just holistically. So you can identify where the roadblocks exist and where there are opportunities for you to be better and maybe change your process a bit. All right, I want to uh, send it over to Brandy one more time here. Uh, talk about some uh, turnover metrics. Yeah, so I'm I'm going to build on what Brett was talking about here. Not all recruitment channels are are created equal, and I want to preface this by saying, so you're on the line saying, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, she's with my CNA jobs. I want to preface this by saying you need to use a lot of channels to recruit, but to Brett's point, you go to some channels for volume 
and you go to other channels for candidates that are more likely to stick around. That's where my CNA jobs and our partnership with Hireology comes in. So I wanted to give some data to you for you to think about. So when you're thinking about, especially now, those recruitment dollars are precious. When you're thinking about where and how to apply your recruitment dollars, don't just look at applicant volume because it it feels good. You know, um, the reality is companies today can no longer recruit their way out of a retention problem. You need to recruit people that are more likely to stick around, and then you need to get them to stick around once once they're there, right? Like that's how you get to, to more uh, billable hours. You should be looking at kind of going up the chain a little bit here and measuring your uh, recruitment spend based on turnover and where your highest uh, retention candidates are coming from. And here's why. I'm going to share some data with you. If you look at the chart here, this is data from a large home care network. So more than 300 offices across the nation. Um, my CNA jobs drives traffic and applicants for all their offices. There's other channels that drive, you know, traffic for all of their offices as well. And this is their data. This is this is not our data. But if you look here, this is the retention information. So if you look at 30 days, I made a hire. Who's still on board at 30 days? Gray is all channels. Blue is my CNA jobs. Now look at 60 days. Look how much higher that blue line is. So hires made from my CNA jobs were 20% more likely to stick around at 60 days and 24% more likely at, at 90 days. So I bring this up not just to say my CNA jobs is, is great. Of course, we, we'd love the, the opportunity to partner with you on, on the line. But I bring this up so you look at the data because a lot of companies don't look at the data. It feels good. If you think about um, a recruiter or someone that's posting a job, it feels really good to go post a job and get a lot of applicants, right? It feels better if you actually make a hire and that hire is still working after 90 days. And it's just a different way to think about it. Like one of the things that we see in our organization is if we call into a home care agency or a senior living community and we say, who, who, who manages recruitment? You always get an answer. If you call in and says, who cares about uh, turnover? Who manages retention? Sometimes everyone does or not one person does. So it's actually a way, if you're on the line and you do recruitment, it's a way to kind of up your game a little bit and think a little bit differently. Like $1 in should equal a lot of dollars out. So um, just wanted to give you a kind of different perspective, if you will. When you think about 2024 and you're taking notes on what are the KPIs that I should be looking at, hands down, I, I would look at your, your turnover metrics by source. Great. Thank you, Brandy. Um, and that is a great way to wrap things up. So uh, I'll go ahead and recap uh, the high level of what we went through today. Uh, number one, there's still a massive short of caregiver talent out there today, and that's not going to go away anytime soon. Number two, caregivers are a unique population uh, demographically. And so the better we can understand them, the better we can target our ads and recruit them. Number three, caregivers want flexibility, growth, and a great workplace culture, right? Besides pay, those three things are really what matters to them. And number four, recruiting and hiring top caregiver talent requires you to do really two things. Number one, build jobs that meet caregiver needs, meet them where they are, meet them and, and, and give them what they want. And last, distribute those jobs effectively on all the right channels. Again, uh, not just the channels that give you the most volume that might feel good now, but effectively on the right channels that drive hires and that drive retention. That's what matters. So um, I want to give uh, a big shout out to Brandy and the Michigan Air team. Uh, they're always uh, great to work with. Um, if you'd like to get in touch with us uh, or have a question that comes up uh, after this, feel free to uh, contact us at the emails listed below. And I think at this time, if there's any questions, we are happy to go ahead and answer them. Yeah, and I think there's a poll too. If we could go ahead and launch a poll while we get the um, the Q and A for anyone that wants to get connected to what we talked about today. If you want to learn more about hireology, uh, if you want to learn more about my CNA jobs and hireology and how we uh, work together, we actually have a unique program where we offer unlimited jobs for our hireology customers. Or if you want to talk a little bit more about how we can help from a retention perspective, that is our Coach Up Care brand.
All right. Thank you so much, Brandy and Brett. Let's just wait a few seconds to see if we get some questions from the attendees. A quick reminder to our attendees, if you do have any questions for our speakers today, now is a great time um, to put them in either in the chat or in the Q&A box. All right, well, let's wrap this up. Um, I would like to thank everyone for attending today's webinar. And please note that this session will be sent out to our registrants within the next 24 hours. Um, and of course, thank you to our speakers, Brandy and Brett, for a fantastic presentation. We hope everyone enjoyed today's session and we wish you a lovely day. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.